living tissue is dynamic. All living tissue, no matter how static it may appear, is constantly being turned over. It's constantly being broken down and replaced. And that's true for your bone, your blood cells, your skin, everything. Now, one of the least dynamic tissues is cartilage. And I thought I'd start with that because it's a nice example of the intrinsic dynamism of living tissue. What this graph shows you is that for the first two decades in life, the thickness in a cartilage plate, let's say it's one in your knee, will increase. Arbitrary units on the left. And it increases as your body size increases. This is just part and parcel of growing up. Between the years 20 and 40, cartilage plates will retain the same sort of thickness. They're neither growing nor wearing out. You don't want them to grow any larger at that point. They become excessively thick and unstable. And then at about the age of 40, you start to lose the cartilage plate. It starts to wear and tear, and you're now breaking it down more quickly than you can replace it. It gets thinner and thinner, and then about the age of 60, let's say you start to develop the symptoms of osteoarthritis. You have a pain in your joint. You go to the doctor, he or she tells you, you have osteoarthritis, nothing you can do about it, old thing, it's just something you have to live with, and that everybody suffers as they get older. In fact, you've had osteoarthritis for 20 or 30 years, but the bulk of it has been preclinical, and most tissues have a lot of natural redundancy built into them, and you can lose quite a lot of function or tissue itself before it becomes symptomatically obvious. But you don't have to live with that, because if you can find a way of boosting the rate of repair, you can now become once again anabolically dominant and start to regrow the cartilage. This was shown up in two very interesting studies published in 2005, the GUIDE and the GATE studies. The GUIDE was done at 13 American universities, GUIDE at 13 European hospitals, and they were looking at osteoarthritis of the knee, and what they found was that glucosamine, a amino sugar, which is taken up by chondrocytes, cells in the cartilage bed which make new cartilage. If you do that, if you give them the building blocks that they need to make new cartilage, they say thank you very much, they increase the rate at which they can make it, to the point where it now outstrips the rate of cartilage loss. So now you are no longer catabolically dominant, you are anabolically dominant, and your cartilage plate starts to regrow. Both of these studies showed that glucosamine was as effective as the rather toxic non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs as effective, but far less toxic. Here's what's happening. Let's take this patient who's in their, let's say they're uh, coming up according to the graph to their 60th birthday. They've developed the symptoms marked here in red. So what we do is we give them glucosamine and increase the rate at which they are forming a cartilage. They are now anabolically dominant. They start to grow new cartilage. It's increasing in mass and slowly as the cartilage plate gets thicker, functionality is restored to the joint and pain is abolished. This is not a, an acute short-term response like the reduction in pain that you get when you take anti-inflammatories. It takes rather longer, but this is profoundly more effective. It, is, it looks as if it's genuinely curative as opposed to merely treating symptoms. The same approach holds true for type 2 diabetes. This is a study that was carried out at the Massachusetts General Hospital. It was called the Diabetes Prevention Program. And in the group who were considered to be at risk of developing diabetes, over a period of 10 years, uh, they were taken through a program which ensured that they lost 7% of their weight. They took a very small amount of exercise. 150 minutes exercise a week is only 20 minutes a day. Hardly an exhaustive program. And in this group, the risk of progressing to clinical diabetes was reduced by 60%. How effective is that compared to drugs? Well, it's twice as effective as giving people prophylactic anti-diabetic drugs. Diabetes is, in general, it is a lifestyle disease. There's not much point in trying to head it off at the pass using drugs. You need to correct the lifestyle that is creating the disease. Metabolic syndrome is a precursor to type 2 diabetes. This is a study that was done by the very wonderful Karen Esposito at the uh, third, I think, University of Naples, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2004. 180 patients were either put on the prudent, which is the current government recommendations, or the Mediterranean diet for two years. In the Mediterranean group, there was weight loss, and a number of biochemical changes, all of which were showing that their metabolisms were being normalized. 
after two years in the placebo group, 12% no longer had features of metabolic syndrome. They'd changed their lifestyle to the point where they had effectively cured themselves. But in the Mediterranean group, slightly over half now had no features whatsoever of the metabolic syndrome. Testimony to the enduring health and the benefits of the Mediterranean diet. This is an earlier study carried out by Michel de Lorgeril, published in Circulation in 1999. The prevention of secondary coronary artery disease, in other words, people who'd already had one heart attack and didn't really want to have a second. Carried out in Lyon, therefore inevitably known as the Lion Heart Study, 600 patients studied for three years. Statins, the best the pharmaceutical industry can come up with, and not in my view very much good at all, reduced the risk of a secondary infarct by approximately 20%. Dietary modification, this was basically the Mediterranean diet again, reduced the risk of a secondary heart attack by 50 to 70 percent. In other words, three times more effective than the pharmaceutical intervention. Can you use diet to reduce the risk of cancer? Well, this study by Dean Ornish, uh, who is, I think, at the University of California in Los Angeles, uh, was a prostate cancer prevention study. 93 men with early prostate cancer, and he put them onto a intervention diet. Not, in my view, a particularly well-designed one. It was basically his cardiovascular risk reduction diet, and I think he could have done more. Nonetheless, he established proof of principle. PSA scores rose in the control group, which is pretty much what we expect. In those men who were on his particular risk reduction diet, PSA scores fell. Very interestingly, when you took serum from these two different groups, the prostate cancer cells in Petri dishes, their growth was inhibited to a small extent by serum from the control group, but serum from the diet group, in other words, all the things that had got into the bloodstream from the food that these people were eating, inhibited the cancer cells eight times more effectively. Does that matter clinically? Well, yes, the results suggest that it does. At the end of one year, out of the control group, six out of 46 required surgery for cancer. In the diet group, none of them required surgery. Cancers had been stabilized.